back to the system of governance where 80% of the funds still goes back to government. That's so they true. determine what happens, even in the private sector. Yes. Wow. You know, this is People the who have made it in Nigeria today, in terms of businesses, have relied on government patronage. Let me take Dangote alone, away. But even Dangote cannot claim that his you know, success within the past 10 years has not been through the influence of government. But name any other businessman in Nigeria. They are to do what they are because of government patronage. You know, I, I, now I think uh, we can go back to the issue you raised because we really haven't actually looked at it uh, critically and it has to do with the immigration exercise. You know, Nigerians woke up and it was a sad day for us as a people and as a nation. Uh, there was hardly any family. You don't have someone who knew someone who went for that particular interview. Uh, as it is now, the way you've painted it, and you said presidential system and so many other uh, punitive measures that we would have used in reining some people in order can't possibly work. What would you say about that particular exercise and uh, uh, the way to address this uh, to, to forestall future occurrence? You see, when ministers you soup you know, you saw powers that are not vested in them by law. We always have problems. In the present exercise, the minister was playing his own personal card. Because recruitment is a management function. It is not a ministerial function. And if I read correctly what I have been reading, there was a clash between the board, of the immigration board, and the minister challenging him that you have no right to conduct this exercise. That is a purely management exercise. But despite and in spite of that, he went along because the powers vested in him under the Constitution, which is being delegated to him, Section 5 of the Constitution says, Mr. President is in charge of all executive powers. And when we lawyers interpret it, you know, he might seek succor under that. But when a statute has been promulgated and the statute has created a board and a management for a department, why should the minister interfere in the day and day running? In doing this now, I'm not saying he was looking for personal gains, but any reasonable man seeing him grabbing this power, giving the exercise to a, 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 you know, a company, and by the grace of God, if exercises is done to look at those who own the company, there might be people who are related to him. I am not saying that, but the possibility is there. Now, what has happened to the money? The bare-faced infantry not to account for the money is because of the system. Because only Mr. President can remove him. The House cannot remove him. The House may pass resolutions. What has happened to this lady in SEC? The House passed resolution. She was removed by the board. The presidency returned her. So the House can only shout. They cannot bite. The man knows that. It is the system. It boils down to this. But shouldn't sorry, we be talking about returning the money? Yes. <laughs> I'm happy you raised this point. Before you can ask somebody to return money, first of all, you must know how much was realized from the exercise both in Lagos, Kaduna, and Abuja. You must ask him, how much did he pay out to the consultants? How much was realized and how much was paid out to the consultants? At least in any consultancy, maybe 10, 15, or even 20% could be given to the consultant. What happened to the balance? Was it paid into the ministry's account? These are facts which the public should ask him to talk about. Now, if he now says he has paid the money into the account, in whose account? Is it in the ministry's account or in the immigration's account? There are many things that are, and it's only a judicial inquiry, commission of inquiry, that will get all this in and will give those resolutions the efficacy of law so that whatever they say has happened, will be backed by law. I was going to say, the issue of refunds of the money, but then, is the minister beyond prosecution? He's not beyond. There is no immunity for the duration of a minister's tenure. He has no immunity like a governor or Mr. President. 
So if he's found guilty now, he can be charged to court and he can be sentenced. So, so that's not even... That means the minister can be arrested. Oh, yes, he can be arrested. In this case now, several lives have been lost. For he, because, simply because he used stop powers that were not his in the first Definitely. place. Definitely. So how do we move forward from here? Well, as I said, Nigeria will always look... For instance, what should have been the front burner in Nigeria today is this National Assembly. But it is no longer the front burner issue. Because of this incident, people have died. So the newspapers have forgotten what the National Assembly, the goodness of Jonathan in creating the National Assembly, the awareness the papers should be giving to the generality of people of the good work of Mr. President. This incident has now become the front burner issue. And it's a negative, negative act, you know, which should not have been a front burner. But we must arrest it because there have been previous warnings. This is not the first time this man will do this. He did it two years ago, as I understood, and people died then too. Nothing was done. If nothing is done today, posterity will not forgive this government. Yeah, but why haven't we seen any lawyer talking about, uh, or would it be out of place for them to go to court seeking or compelling him to return the monies to the people? Well, I leave that area to my good friend Fala now and others, <laughs> because uh, I am not a, a human rights ac activist. The human rights activists, they can do so. They can do so as a body, and no court will say they don't have the local standard. They can even ask, if the government is not doing anything, they can ask permission from the attorney general to give them a fiat to sue him or to charge him to court. They can do that. Okay, let's take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back and look at... Uh our concluding part of this interview. Please join us again. Welcome back. Uh, concluding moments now of this interview with uh, Mr. Robert Clark, SAN, legal practitioner. Well, looking at all of this, the way the system of governance is structured, that means that no matter how well-intentioned the president is or means, if he gets into that position, he has so many impediments around him, encumbrances, things that will pull him down politically because... As it is, he will have to listen to certain political quarters to do certain things. Can there be a way out of this? Well, what I've always suggested is that democracy is not ordinary the rule of majority. Democracy means more than just majority rule. Democracy means the strengthening of institutions. That is what is lacking in Nigeria. The institutions are not being strengthened, and therefore we can never have democracy. And once you don't strengthen institutions, something like what has happened, where a minister will just wake up and usurp the powers of a, you know, a corporation under him. Like Port's Authority now, we have a civilian uh, uh, chairman there. He will just be behaving as if he's an executive, not strengthening the institutions. Now, Mr. President is being caught in a web. No matter how good intention he is, I have read him. He's a nice man. He's ready to listen. But the system that he's, you know, I don't know what to say, is encompassing him and putting him in a corner. For instance, he has to be nominated by his party if he wants to contest election. He has to seek the support of governors because he knows how much power they have over delegates so that he will not want to do things that will, you know, make him at loggerheads with a particular governor. The president of the Senate is a very influential man in the system. He will not want to have any problem with him so that the system hampers him from being his own man. And if you want true leadership, once you are elected, you must be your own man to take decisions for the interest of Nigeria. Uh. As I said, if I were Mr. President today, this incident that happened, to be independent and to realize that I'm not going to hurt anybody, I would have raised a commission of, a, a judicial commission of inquiry. That makes me 
draw out from you know, the midst of the problem. I will tell the world, oh, I have appointed the Judicial Commission of Inquiry. When the result is out and they castigate anybody, nobody will blame him that he's the one who has done it. Well, well before we go, you know, mm. different regions of the country, they've been meeting, they've been talking. Uh, we've seen the Southwest, the South, South, and uh, the last one was uh, the Northern Conference. Uh, they also met when we had that uh, law of the sea talk, perhaps, and maybe you should bring us up to speed on that, or what you understand by that argument by a gentleman in uh, northern Niger, Baraja. He said, well, the oil actually, there's nothing like oil producing states. And he went further in his argument to talk about the nautical miles and law of the sea, and ultimately talking about the ownership of Niger's oil. OK, I was fortunate to listen to Baraja. His argument, a bit sensible, but has no backing of the law as such. Let me explain to you. I was fortunate in 1972, in my final year in the university, to represent Nigeria internationally under a Philip Jessup competition all over the world. My university came first here in Nigeria. I came second all over the world, and the question was on the law of the sea. At that time, the boundary, the literal boundary of any country was just three kilometers, uh, three nautical miles. Now, there were problems. Many fishing boats will come from Japan to enter into West African coast. So there was a new thinking under maritime law that Outside the continental shelf, and I will explain what the continental shelf is, every country will be given a 200 nautical miles known as the economic zone, where you will control outside your continental shelf, you will control commerce, where you can dig for oil, you can fish. Now Nigeria has about six states that are aborting the, the, the sea. You have Lagos, you have Ogun, you have Delta, you have Bayelsa, you have Aqua Ibom. And these states all are bought. You see, the land mass of any country under international law is that land that comes in from the coastal area into the sea until it gets to the point called the continental shelf. The continental shelf, by definition, is the last point a country's landmass enters the sea. Because the continental shelf is where there's a deepening, a huge deepening. Now, under international Into law, the sea. to the sea, which is almost 1,000 kilometers, or uh, 1,000 meters, or 2,000 meters. That's a deepening. So it's called, geographically, it's called the continental shelf. Therefore, under international law, any country's boundary stops at the point of the continental shelf. So whatever Nigeria lays hold upon as its own today stops at the continental shelf. That is what Baraji is saying. Now, outside the continental shelf, 200 you know, nautical miles belong to Nigeria. Because under international law, the word state is being used. That any state that has you know, boundaries bordering on the sea will be entitled to 200 nautical miles known as economic zone. Now, what happens to those economic Who owns the economic zone? That is the question. Under international law, the definition of state is a sovereign state that is independent of any other state. Okay. Now, my good friend, uh, Sage, I think, wrote an article last week and says all the states in Nigeria that are bordering on this continental shelf, shelf are states known to international law. And I disagree <laughs> because the states in Nigeria are not states known to law under international as sovereign because they are not sovereign. Because they're dependent on They are dependent Nigeria. 
on Nigerian state, that is the sovereign state. So there may be states in Nigeria, but they are not states known to international law because they are not sovereign. So my good friend's argument, I don't buy that. Now, what Baraji is saying is that outside the continental shelf, because Nigerian landmass ends at the beginning of the continental shelf. All those areas outside that belongs to Nigeria as a sovereign state. But I don't buy his argument that that uh, area given to us was given to us because of our landmass. No, it was given to us because of the uh, states in Nigeria that are bordering the coast. Oh. So. The whole, and that is why under our constitution, we have agreed that such economic uh, things yeah. that are found there belong to Nigeria as an entity. And because certain states border the coast and are near the continental shelf, that is why we now say 13% of whatever oil Nigeria gets belongs to them because they you know, their landmass extends under international law to the beginning of the continental chain. All right, uh, that's where we have to let it go today. We've been speaking with Mr. Robert Clark, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, a legal practitioner. Thank you very much indeed for coming and for your interest. It's interesting always comments. my pleasure to be here. Always All right, my pleasure. We'll return after this. We have other matters to focus on today. So join us again if you can. <laughs>